welcome to the Thrill Out Driving podcast and this week we have a very special guest. We have Adil Jal Darukhanawala, better known as the boss man that's at Adil Jal on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. Uh, despite being the doyen of print automotive journalism, you are across social media, extremely active across social media. I don't think anybody tweets as much as you do Adil and on such a wide range of topics from the economic slowdown which you were mm-hmm. yelling at me about to uh, politics to fighter jets i love looking at that stuff and of course your this day in adil's past right so very interesting stuff on your twitter handles uh, before that i am sirish chandran at sirish chandran s i r i s h c h a n d r a n and this is the evo india channel at evo india the podcast is across spotify apple podcast google podcast blah 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 and also back on youtube because a lot of you all asked for it to be on youtube so that's on the evo india channel and coming back to you adil hmm. print automotive journalism digital social what is the future i think it's got to be a mix of everything uh what i really want to see is got to be some depth in the stuff which is being put out the digital media is all about immediacy and in a way it's good newsy stuff but if you are born and brought up on substance depth i think the digital media doesn't play any credence to that sort of a behavior and so yes it is a different thing we have like just look at your magazines itself you are there print very strong when we emote we talk about that same thing cannot be replicated even with a great driving uh, film across of 2 or 3 minutes duration it can embellish the stuff but then the same way you cannot what you call try and make commercial sense out of the digital thing so yes it's a big dichotomy it's a challenge but if you got to be in this business you have to embrace all challenges so let's back the proverbial truck up mm. okay back to the car and bike international days back when i was in short pants uh, and uh, hadn't even learned how to drive all right uh, you had started if i'm not mistaken the second automotive magazine in the country yeah uh, we came in almost about 8 months after the first magazine started and that what year was that uh the first magazine started i think in october 86 and we came out in june 87 june 87 so that was car and bike international that car and bike international that was the magazine that you started yes that i also owned the magazine so you were the publisher as well as yes. the editor and i didn't know a thing about how to do a magazine excepting write about cars and bikes about motorsport first and then everything else so, so why did you start a magazine I didn't know anything else to do about accepting uh, write about cars and bikes. So you had at that time it was again it was a challenge and a motivation. I had done everything so far, organized motocross, got the world championship to India, etc. We had to progress, and it is where the time when the government opened up a lot of doors to foreign car companies, bike companies to come in. So I thought it was opportune at that point in time. Of course, we didn't know head or tail about what is a font, how to lay out a page, nothing. But then we learned on that thing. Eleven years I did Car and Bike International. I didn't make any money out of it, but I learned everything there. So it was phenomenal. And I can't imagine mm-hmm. you you all having too many cars or bikes back in the eighties to put on your cover. Forget doing comparison tests and all that. How did you fill the pages of the magazine? Hmm. just pure passion hmm pure passion and honestly speaking there was a difference between our magazine and the first magazine we started indian auto journal that was a journal a trade journal brought out by a proper publishing house they had the right ingredients to do and work in that uh, trade uh, business sort of speak and give a little bit of a uh, little bit of uh, what we see in the present day magazines we only started off with doing for the enthusiast So yes think about it 84 pages at 7 or 8 rupees cover price and we had about 10 or 12 pages of color everything was black and white so i remember all of that uh-huh. so one of the first magazines that i ever mm-hmm. bought of course my dad bought it for me because i didn't even have pocket money back then was the magazine where there was the sumo on the cover and i believe that was your own sumo yes. and yes. also the contessa which uh, yes. ashraf sheik uh, sheik had written about dilip desai's dilip contessa desai. where uh, i think he went hammer and tongs against the japanese cars and he said he would never rally a japanese car yeah. ever in his life and only the contessa 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 not just contessa alone <laughs> he never wanted to rally uh, 
Japanese car. So, so he had the Contessa, the Fiat 124, he had the earlier Fiat Delight. So he never rallied any. He, he was dead against the gypsy. And you can imagine this must have been 30 years ago at the very least. Yeah. But it played such a crucial role in my formative years that I still remember that car. I don't remember the date or even whatever. Today, it's a great thing you say that. But even till today, I get... Uh, cop, uh, a lot of statements, a lot of comments from readers. Oh boy, I grew up uh, reading car and bike. Some of the doyans in the industry still say very clearly, like Ashish uh, from uh, Classic Legends. He says, you were responsible for me getting into that. Thing. Sanjay Tripathi from Hero Motocar. So, okay, fine. It feels good to hear. But those guys used to write to me and had published their letters in the readers to the letter uh, editor column. So, I think, yeah, it was a very small world then today we've expanded that thing but it was it felt great because it's not just me who was to be put as a pioneer it, it was even these guys the readers who were pioneers in that sort of things you know but that time people read you know yes. i still think people Absolutely. read but then you have a lot of uh, these so called doins of the website world who say that no print is dead uh, do you really think that unfortunately there is a certain thing if you are talking about let's talk about a thing like Look at, I grew up uh, on a stable diet of autosport magazine for my motorsport needs. It was a weekly and I would never be able to do anything without autosport. Even though it came by C-mail three, four months late, it came every week. Unfortunately, autosport has closed its uh, doors now. They've shut up shop, no more print version. Why? Because the reportage which happens in a Grand Prix, three days after the Grand Prix is already dated. So digital plays a role there. It brings us stories very quickly. But if you want to have really great analytical stuff, etc., then you look at Motorsport Magazine, which comes monthly. I think you see those two and you can understand why Motorsport is more relevant. And Motorsport also is an old, it started in 1924 or 23. And it's been going on and I was brought up on that as well. So it's about a question of what is relevant to the times. And motorsport also has got a very strong, very fine digital presence. So I think how you marry that thing. Yes, autosports days are numbered as far as print is concerned. But there's always place for good print stuff. Because I cannot and would not like to take my iPad to read in my garden. I'd like to take a book or a magazine and read uh, So when we say that, we say that I would not like to take my iPad into the toilet. Yes. But you into the garden. So see, that is sophistication of age. Not necessarily. Sometimes I, I want to catch up every time when I have to do that. You, yeah. Adil, you are a hardcore motorsport enthusiast. Uh, if you all don't know, uh, Adil can recount the names of the world champions ever since the Formula One World Championship started. I can't even remember when the Formula One World Championship started. 50, 1950. Nin 1950. Uh, he's, he's got. It's like a walking, talking encyclopedia. No, which, it's, uh, it's not uh, that. It's not. It's not that. It's you grow up with that. You get uh, deeper and deeper into that. I remember you talking oh. about, you know, you would uh, tune into the BBC uh, yeah. World Service broadcast to listen to Formula One updates. Actually speaking, I remember I started writing about cars and bikes in, I still remember the first date, 26th August 1977, when I my first article got featured. But Formula One, we had nothing, we had no recourse to anything. Autosport, Autocar, the British version, which come about three, four months late. So how do we get to grips with knowing who's won what? So BBC World Service had a sports roundup program on the radio thing at 11.15 in the night and another one at 3.15 in the morning. So if you miss the 11.15 uh, thing for whatever reason and there were no digital radios then, it was analog. So you had to tune those things properly. So if we miss that 11.15 thing to know the results, you had to stay awake till 3.15. But we did that because... Your parents allowed you to... There were no light out curfews? No, <laughs> never ever. That thing never happened. They actually speaking, they would tell me why the hell am I wasting my time with all these things. The other used to put a lot of motorsport on the cover of Car and Bike International. My first cover itself was uh, Pari Dakar. Pari Dakar, BMW. yes. Yeah. And I remember reading about Hari Singh and all the JK versus MRF rivalries, oh, all of that. Uh, the Himalayan rally used to be on the cover. Uh, you were hardcore motorsport enthusiast. You also organized, like you said, the first uh, world championship in yeah, uh, Pune, the yeah. Supercross. Yeah. yeah. How difficult was it back then to organize events or was it easier back then? In a certain way, it was easier because it was uh, new. People embraced it. They took to it. 
unfortunately what happened is we did it for we started uh, stadium motocross in pune in india in 1983 84 85 86 80, 88 and 89 we did or 89 and 90 we did the two world championship events by then car and bike had already do started dominating my senses so i could not devote more time to that so when we gave it away to the other guys to carry that thing forward the lack of innovation later on got some fatigue factor so you cannot keep on doing that and honestly speaking the fmsci was totally dominated by carwalas <laughs> and mm -hmm. they used to make the money from the bikers mm -hmm. but never used to put the money back for the bikers and i'm sure the crowds also came from bikes right? oh yeah absolutely when rotel trophy we had the nehru stadium packed with about 40000 people to its capacity you can imagine that thing so yes it was tough but because the spectacle was such we had great sponsors can you imagine we had in 83 we had four riders swedish riders come from sri lanka and our budget for the event was complete event was 10 lakhs everything put together next year we scaled it up and we are the factory honda team here the factory yamaha team here we had about 21 riders from all over the world our budget for that year was about 25 lakhs you cannot think which in today's money would be probably 25 crores it could be about half of that it could be half. so what has happened is costs have gone way out you can't charge that same amount of gate money for spectators and what not so yes the sport also has its challenges but uh, we are not a entire country is not going to what you call be so uh, welcoming of motorsport because it's an alien thing when you are looking at fuel efficiency always True, yeah, yeah, yeah. to get sport or performance is a way out thing you know i remember you had started the bajaj factory team also yeah the road crafters uh, race crafters race crafters race crafters and what do you uh, i'm sure you all raced what the kb 100s no, the no, m80s no 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 we started with the m80s and the chetaks and the cubs and at that time uh, in chulavaram the top dogs in that class were the pearl yamahas and the uh, tvs bikes and the first year when we went with these weird contraptions, the M80s, everyone laughed at us. <laughs> they were not laughing after we finished the races because we thrashed them. <laughs> Absolutely. Two years we thrashed them and we were so good at that thing, Bajaj stopped the racing. Because <laughs> we won everything inside. <laughs> so, your, uh, the team folded up because you all were too good? We folded up because, absolutely. We also did, thanks to Bajaj, they were very proactive. We, the KB100 came across, I think, in 86 and it came across. And because Kawasaki came in, they also bought four Kawasaki motocross bikes, two 250s and two 120s. With that also, we were very successful. We raised the KXs for about two years. We won the Rodel Trophy, Indian classes and all that. But then Bajaj said, we have won everything. We don't have to prove <laughs> anything. Unfortunately, that has been mm -hmm. a sort of uh, constant in my life. We win everything mm -hmm. and then we, say we have attained everything. I, I remember a lot of people, mm -hmm. when I used to go and cover the races, they used to say, Adil, yeah, yeah, they used to remember your t-shirt. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was something like, here comes trouble. Here comes trouble. That so, was because of uh, <laughs> Sholavaram. When the first time we went to Sholavaram in 77 or 78, uh, there were about 52 of us who went from Pune to race there. And we used to live for going for that one race in a year. So the entire thing was to make the bikes get ready and to get 52 bikes pre-race scrutineered and the Chennai guys were very scared of us. <laughs> not Sorry, it was not Chennai, it was Madras at that time. The Madras guys were very scared of us. So every time they do something to give irritate us as, oh, this is not right on the bike, it's unsafe, this, that. But we had done everything. So this one scrutineer was there and he was really <laughs> something else. So I got a t-shirt made, here comes the <laughs> Whenever he'd buy a, get a bike, he would see and he knew that you had to pass. Do you have a picture of that? I think I have. Uh, you must dig it out. So if you're watching this on YouTube and if Adil has <laughs> dug it out, you will see that right now on your screen. Uh, Adil, from Car and Bike days, then mm. you started Overdrive. Uh, that I remember as a young enthusiast being a massive step forward. Car and Bike, International, I think Auto India back then uh, didn't have all color. Uh, Overdrive was double or thrice the number of pages, was all color, had tons of international content, uh, had proper road testing. It was the proper template for the modern day magazine, you know. How long did you take to set that up? I always wanted to do it Car and Bike. I didn't have the money. Mm -hmm. Simple as that. Mm. Uh, the other guys, Business India, had the money, but they never did it. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, the Tata Info Media guys were very clear that they said, what is your, how do you define the magazine should be? I said, this is the thing. And 
we married the concept of uh, an American magazine, Road and Track, which was really very good in that sense. And we also married certain concepts we took from other British and German magazines. Mm. And we bought a happy balance there. And that was really... The template which Overdrive set at that time is still carried on forward. If you see, care to think about it. The layouts may have changed a little bit, but Mm. basically the format has remained the same. So what were those early Overdrive days like? Oh, brilliant. We were up and running from day one. You never look back. And we had, at the end of the day, understand one thing, India had got just three magazines at that time. Car and Bike, Auto India, and BS Motoring. Mm. There was no other magazine. Mm. Sure, there were trade journals, Automotive Engineering and Trader, Motor India, but those catered to the trade, absolutely, the retail, the spare part guys. So that was different. That never came into this journal. So when we got Car and Bike going, we try to select people who loved cars and bikes. Mm. If you do not do that, then you may be, however proficient, engineer, wordsmith, etc. It doesn't work. So we try to, what you call, get people. And even if we, the person didn't have the requisite skills, we mentored them, we did that thing. And that's how it happened. And I think that was the font of automotive journalism in the country those years. Yeah, I can attest to that because a year and a bit after you started Overdrive, you found me. I was still doing my engineering. I was in my final year of engineering and uh, I was uh, interning at Thermax. I was also interning at Overdrive. As soon as I finished with my engineering, I started off at Overdrive. And I remember our team back then, every single person from the team are editors right now at different magazines. Every single Everyone. person became an editor. And that team was probably the best team that any automotive magazine I th- I had think, ever seen. Yeah, I think that, uh, like I said, across over there, one key thing which which uh, is there with me is share your knowledge with everyone, irrespective of what you know, what you don't know. If you don't know, say, I don't know. You may be the big boss. But if you don't know, ask for the thing. And I think... That really helps. Means I was a duffer as far as computers were concerned. But so many of you guys were much more savvier. So it, it was a happy balance. And I think that is the only reason why we succeeded very well. And the management was very good. They thought about us, whatever we taught, uh, asked of them, they supported us to the hilt. Uh, when we started off, the internet was in its infancy. At home, I had a, a student connection. Yeah. In the office, the I remember... The dial-up connection, we had... <laughs> at the overdrive office, we had one computer with a dial-up connection where one person used to be sitting on Correct. that and logged on to DPPI and, and downloading out. Formula 1 and MotoGP images. Right. And each image would probably take around 20, 25 minutes. True. So, back in those days, there was no Google journalism. No, if you want, not forget <laughs> that we used to get a whole set of slides... Yeah. every week after the Grand Prix. Yes. So yeah. then we had a very different thing. Also. So uh, we used to actually research using printed material. Uh, of course, those days there was a bacha. So when Adil used to go for motor shows, uh, two weeks later by courier, by You'd DHL, big, there would be a big box full of press kits and we would read press kits. True. And that is how we got knowledge. Uh, but uh, Shiri, this is one thing very important. I've seen many uh, people right now, many kids right now who come into this thing. They are all enamored by the glamour of wheels. They have to read. Many people don't read, which I feel is really speaking one of the Achilles heels of today's automotive journalism. I'll repeat that again. Adil says, and we all say, read, 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 read. Yeah. And read printed material. Absolutely. Uh, everybody reads stuff on their phones. I can see that. No, everybody's looking at Instagram and Twitter and all of that. But read a book. Because on a digital device, you will have an email popping up. You'll have a notification from Facebook popping up. And you cannot concentrate. Whereas Absolutely. in a book, nothing else is popping up at you. So it's important to read. And that's where your knowledge is. And that's where our knowledge was. We used to get, uh, I remember, Autocar, Car UK, tons of magazines. Yeah, lots of and magazines. No, we would be like, I, I remember I would be like I fighting know, with know, you. Adil, give me some magazines. Yeah, let me read. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. we would read it not only cover to cover, we would also read the comments in the car and bike prices pages. Absolutely. The plus and minus we used to be reading Absolutely. all of that. Absolutely. And that's how we actually learned. I've got, I've just got a, a recent book by... Uh, Patrick Lankama, who is one of the legendary designers in the automotive. Renault's big. Uh, He's just penned a book. And in that, he's, I always you say, God is in the details. Mm. He says, is it God or the devil in the details? So you had to go into the details Mm -hmm. to find out whether you Mm -hmm. found God or you found the Mm -hmm. devil there. Uh, What are you reading these days? 
I know you are you I devour am, a lot I of am, stuff. I am so. right now because I'm researching a lot of things for my next two books. I'm doing a book on the history of the Jeep in India. Mhm. Okay. So that will be out in February at Auto Expo. Okay. So a lot of it pertaining to the Jeep type of vehicle in India. Mhm. Because it's India centric. and uh, i'm also reading a lot like patrick lagamar's book is num- one of the lot i've got and i'm reading one other book which has just come in this is of a legendary wheeler dealer come racer come historian come by the name of colin crab he had a very checkered life so he used to come to india and collect cars he was well connected yeah. it's a rollicking uh, adventure story of his life so when you look at that and he used to hobnob with all the maharajas everything he uh, found out so many great cars in india and what not so i think this is linked to our history as well you know mm-hmm. the small bit but if you do not read those things you'll never know about our history you are a massive fan of history you are a car historian if i might you have uh, to be here yeah, in this thing you cannot there's no going away from that so there is no demarcation between modern cars vintage no. cars classic cars can it never is a- can never be and should not be it should not be uh, i've always had this thing that if you're not into motorsport you can never be a Absolutely. good automotive journalist you have to be first be into motorsport and then everything follows uh, so i have my theory about it you tell me why why motorsport is so important if the engine doesn't do what we want it to do it just not work <laughs> you cannot have an electric thing coming and humming like a jet plane without any sound <laughs> doesn't do anything doesn't move my soul it'll move me for sure mm-hmm. but i need to be in control mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and i think how see li- uh, we used to live for that one race in a year in the 70s in our teens to go to sholavaram why we had only the rajdoot the java and the uh, royal enfield mm. but those three and we had the scooters of course but those three classes there would be 40 riders with their bikes for the one set 85 class with the java and so rajdoots and the enfield crusaders mm-hmm. the javas and the enfield 200s would be there in the 263 class there would be about 45 50 right and the bullets would be also of the same number when this thing happened everyone was into it they would tune their bikes to death that fine edge and those bikes were very the metallurgy was suspect not like today's bikes etc everything but still we really enjoyed doing that thing mm. today with all the best cars and bikes in the world the fields have fallen dramatically mm. they are not even one third they are one mm. fourth of what they yes, were yes yeah. so i feel that uh, so you have to have a feel for the sport you need to have experienced it other uh, so vintage cars are very important but i also feel that motorsport is crucial in terms of understanding automobiles if you're not interested in motorsport you will never be a proper car and bike journalist okay the most important thing let's understand why motorsport is important overall in the development of the mm. car or the bike many people in india unfortunately but rightly so that uh, india is always deprived of uh, essential uh, raw materials for crude oil and what not so we have this major lacuna there so fuel efficiency is of paramount important but in the world of uh, automotive development development if you do not indulge in performance you will never get the efficiency mm-hmm. many people have forgotten that so first you have to get your cars and bikes to perform mm-hmm. so once you have that level of performance you can then if you are only looking at efficiency you are dumbing down perform so you mm-hmm. need to be efficient first so this is a driver right from the very first race meet in the world in 1894 mm-hmm. so that's how it has got to be we indians have not especially our oems think about it there are oems like ford like mercedes benz like bmw who have been into racing but they have not supported racing in india mm-hmm. because they only want to sell mm. unfortunately this trend has been also caught on by everyone like maruti for instance it should have had a dedicated race department right from the beginning mm-hmm. not just spurts and uh, fits and starts across mm-hmm. over there so i think you need that sustenance mm-hmm. i think in the only manufacturer as i see right now doing their bit two manufacturer volkswagen for one and mahindra for another mm-hmm. i think they have to be applauded mm. because they are going against the flow mm. and they're doing very well uh, but in bikes we have a lot of them so we have tvs that is constantly been there tvs was the Hero. only one to it was the only one at that time but again what has happened now is 
everyone has fallen into this cocoon of safeguarding the turf and it's a one make mm-hmm, champion mm-hmm. that's no good that's mm-hmm. not competition mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so you have and i think the fmsc has also played its own role in popularizing this one make thing and taking out the competitive mm-hmm, element mm-hmm. you have to what do you call get the guys to come across on a single platform and it should be man against man manufacturer against mm-hmm. manufacturer that's mm-hmm. the essence of the sport so adil uh, overdrive mm-hmm. uh, you did some really out there stories i remember those 24 hour endurance runs that we did yeah, at the vrd super. with the hironda charisma and the and alto, the alto. Uh, those things had never been attempted before where did you come up with these ideas i wanted to do it we knew that we had to do something different uh, like i said whatever we do we have to be different in mm-hmm. any and every so how did we we had to push the envelope in the mind more than mm. anywhere else mm. so i thought that uh, given the suitability of uh, track to do an event like this mm. because if you go to chennai or you go to now the boot circuit the tracks are great for racing but they are not conducive to record breaking mm-hmm. because every corner everything you cannot what you call go beyond third or fourth gear yep. in chennai yes. where uh, both you may what you call hit top gear on yep. the straight so you lose a lot of time at every mm. gear change every corner here at the uh, amandagar thing it was flat out pedal mm. to the metal mm. and i think that was I, and everywhere uh, record breaking has happened at nardo or at brooklands or anywhere at indianapolis the ovals gave you that thing so we had something in our backyard mm. i thought let's make use of it and we are very good because at that time maruti had two three people who really appreciated such ideas mm. and also we are fortunate that the alto was not doing well the new one <laughs> so we said okay let's do something and the alto delivered and we wanted to use the 1100 alto but yeah. they said do it with the 800 yeah. so we did it with the 800 and 3030 kilometers in 24 hours was pretty good here yeah and, and hero hero honda that was much charisma had never done in hero had never done any racing yeah so that was the first attempt then they gave us the thing and they were say just go out and do it this and they thought mm-hmm. it was child's play mm-hmm. we made it look like child's play 2525 mm-hmm. kilometers mm-hmm. non stop uh, how many records do you have to your name in the limca books i don't know i never <laughs> did i don't even know what uh, what was your stand out story at overdrive or let's say send out stories mm. i know for certain one thing the very first scoop for any magazine in the country was done by current bike international which was what it was september or august 1987 mm-hmm. we caught the tata mobile stranded on bombay pune road <laughs> and we made it the first scoop ever it was there the cover of the issue the tata mobile the tata mobile before it was launched mm-hmm. so that was one uh, did you get into shit with the manufacturer yeah many times <laughs> many times but at the end of the day you have to reason with them sometimes and the uh, there's a there was a pretty uh, huge lack of uh, understanding mm. of the product planners or the marketing guys at that it was earlier they said no how can you even dare write against us mm. So, mm. but we had to reason with them i think the thing has shifted for a uh, for the better mm. in a lot of ways but still today given the fragility of the commercial section manufacturers okay okay you may have made your point but we'll what do you call stop advertising mm-hmm. so these sort of things happen you know mm-hmm. but un- unfortunately the manufacturer have to realize that we are the best avenue to tell their great points about their products to the mm-hmm. people mm-hmm. if they are faulting at the defaulting in their repertoire they need to be pulled up as mm. simple as that mm. we have mm. got no enmity to knock someone on the head mm-hmm. i'll give narrate one incident uh, we started car and bike international in uh, september 1998 mm-hmm. our first anniversary issue uh, september 1999 had a 8 9 car small car test and the santro and the matis we joined yeah, overdrive adil you're talking that's about that's what you overdrive yeah. with a joint uh, Uh, winners the, yeah the matis and the central and we said yeah. that our uh, choice would be uh, the matis mm. so hyundai really flared up and what not and they said how dare you and they said took another magazine and said this magazine i said fine yeah. go we have got no quarrel with that magazine saying that thing mm. but mm. that magazine doesn't define the standards we said mm. not do i think we, so they didn't they, they really were upset mm. then the accent came in mm. and 
Trust me, Hyundai didn't give us any cars, mm. never called us for press. We bought the accident ourselves. No, no, Adil. Uh, I'll correct you there. Hmm. I had joined then hmm. and my brother-in-law had the hmm. Hyundai dealership hmm. in Pune. So, I got the accident hmm. from my brother-in-law. Yes, and yes. It's an interesting story because, hmm. so I was driving the car and I remember Aspi had also hmm. just joined as the road test editor. So, we were doing the Opel Corsa also. And uh, we were doing it at Babdev Ghat, if I'm not mistaken. And uh, Aspi, obviously, you know, racer boy. First, they shot the Fiero. Now, Aspi getting the pegs to grind. Then the Corsa, you know, full body lean. So, I said, shit, man, I also should showcase, you know, that I'm also a hot shit driver. First corner, when accent understeering. Second corner, the accident I started understeer. I lifted off and spun sure. the car in the middle of the road. And I thought, shit, okay, first day, first show, that is it. My mom's going to pack me off and send me to the States to study. And I thought that was the end of my career. But that's how we got the accent, right? No, no <laughs> but we had bought the accent also. Okay. We uh, bought the accent. Oh, uh, one of the company cars. Yeah, yeah. yeah we, we bought yeah. the accent and we did a cover story and we said, it's a great car. And all of a sudden, I remember Mr. Ku was there. He came, he called me, he says, wonderful story. Hmm. I said, fine, thank you. I didn't say anything yeah. And uh, within a couple of days, he landed up at the office in Pune. Mm -hmm. And we welcomed him and all that. I said, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. We do not say anything to our guests. He said, great story. I said, we did a great story in our anniversary issue also. Mm -hmm. And it's rather insulting to hear that because the story about the accent is good. So you are telling me a great story. Mm -hmm. We did a great story then as well. Mm -hmm. I think he got the point. He said, yes. It was very sporting on his part to say, yes, hmm. we misunderstood. I said, yeah, the thing is that you have, if you don't take a stand, you will be totally what you call steamroller. Hmm. So hmm. you have to take a stand and stand for the right stuff, not hmm. the wrong stuff. Hmm. So overdrive were seminal years for the automotive industry. After that, you went and started off Car India and Bike India, also CV India. Yeah. Uh, what were those early days like? We wanted to be separate from... Uh, uh, Partition the cars away from the bikes and mm. vice versa because both of them needed a different universe. Mm. And I think in a tour, it was tough across over there because the marketing guy said, oh, we can't get the money for both magazines this way. But we still held on to that thing. I was there for only two and a half years mm. because, uh, but we laid the foundation stones for uh, that to happen. Mm. And uh, right now we have Evo India and we have Fast Bikes India. Yep. So, yes. Probably I'm the only guy who's headed both the bike magazines in the country. Yeah. But I think that this is the nature of the beast. You had to do that. I think more important was your innings after that, where you started Zig Wheels with yeah, Times they, of India. Uh, Times right. of India came calling. Uh, they were after me for a long time. Mm. But uh, certain things, my mm. wife was ailing and whatnot. So I didn't take that thing on. So, But when we started uh, Zig Wheels, this was one of the finest uh, stints in my life after Overdrive and Car and Bike International. That you had got the chance to do something which was never been done. Create a 360 degree environment over print. So think about it, Times of India and Economic Times every week supplements nationally. Mm. Then a website. Mm. The first, we were the number three website in the country after timesofindia.com and ed.com. Mm -hmm. I don't think Zigwheels now, right now has that sort of, but we did that. Again, like I said, we were too good for our own selves. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but how does a print journalist, a print editor, mm -hmm. transition to become a digital editor? Don't you, everybody says you need to completely different toolkits, but I guess it's the same toolkit, right? It's the same. The thing is that, don't allow yourself to be dictated by what the other guys want mm. to tell you that. Mm -hmm. You have to have your own mind to that, you mm. know. So, and at the end of the day also, get the uh, content thing very, very uh, spot on. You content know? is king. It's, see, content is king, but without context, it's nothing. Mm -hmm. So, you need to, what do you call, do that. Mm -hmm. And you need to also stay relevant to the times. You have to. That goes without saying. But we encompassed such a wide breadth of uh, topics on the website itself mm. whereas other websites see where did India come from it came from carwale.com mm. again buy and sell sites. yes then uh, whosoever were there so they came from that we said uh, Times of India also wanted to make a commercial section I said we don't come into any commerce thing you mm. can use the front end of ours mm. and you can have a back end where you can do your e-commerce so the front end was Tremendously successful. Mm. So when Carwale got sold to a German company, mm. 
the valuation guys is in the times of india group came and said let's sell off mm-hmm. and we got something some phenomenal figure mm mm-hmm. uh adil that's what you've been doing on a mm-hmm. professional level right now you now doing books uh your first it's, one was it's, it's got to it's about giving back it's about giving back it's, about it's giving also back. very interesting your first one was winning with uh, no it was not the first one the first one was uh uh the classics and thoroughbreds no the zigwheels uh, motorsport annuals okay then classics and thoroughbreds then we had the auto tech book mm-hmm. then we had got winning then we got volkswagen uh we java java then java is coming yeah. right now <laughs> and uh, there are three four bo- more books mm-hmm. in the pipeline mm-hmm. let's talk about a little bit of the thrill of riding and let's talk about bajaj and the new chetak electric scooters do you think the time has come for electrics especially in the scooters and in the think, uh, no little segments i think the future for e mobility in india will be in two wheelers mm. all ones and in public transport in the city okay cars i still have my really strong reservations mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. They, but two wheelers and uh, public uh, transport mass transport systems that india can what do you call live with that and live very well with that and how do you get electric two wheelers right and how do you get customers to actually buy electric two wheelers you first and foremost you got to must get the uh, price equation mm-hmm. proposition correct uh, even right now uh, the bajaj thing they say about between 1 and 1 and 1/2 lakhs mm. which is on the steep side mm. plus range anxiety how do you get this thought about range anxiety out mm. i also want to see across over there recharging mm. at the offices mm. so there are issues mm. which need to be sorted out mm. that i think the day those issues are sorted out mm. but two wheelers will be dead ringers for e mobility mm. cars i don't think so mm-hmm. i don't think so then thank god for that <laughs> you found interns like me and you groomed us into becoming who we are today what would your advice be to young automotive journalists what should they actually hone their skills in before they come and write to say you or somebody else listen carefully to many people mm. read mm. be on top of everything mm. read the good bad ugly everything mm. don't only write don't go to a ferrari first <laughs> go to a fiat first <laughs> let experience the breakdowns there <laughs> understand the character <laughs> then you go it's not to say that ferraris don't break ferraris also break but then don't start with ferraris because then you will not enjoy the breakdowns of the <laughs> fiats <laughs> so go <laughs> through that progression <laughs> i think you need to experience everything across the world and what do you think of the youtube generation today i think given this idiot thing we carry in our pockets across over there you are always connected mm. so sometimes for a light uh, in uh, thing across you want to see a new car or a new bike but there is the message which goes on there even a short snappy piece 2 3 minute stuff mm. on youtube to do that thing it's good mm. but that has to be backed up with something substantial mm-hmm. so let's give me one one line on each of these bikes the interceptor 650 the best bike built in india the best bike built in india ever the java great comeback uh the chedak it had to come the pulsar oh that is a standard for the sports bike in the country the expulse it's getting there hero is getting there yeah uh, hero is getting there hero is getting there the, what should they do more i think they need to what you call have a product planning or a marketing team mm. which doesn't sell their economizers to what you call handle the expulse mm-hmm. expulse needs to be handled by marketing guys who enjoy riding who embrace or who know the thought about performance performance of this end and economy mm. on the just don't match mm. the activa oh that you know, save the scooter in the country save the scooter in the country yeah, yeah. the splendor it is the soul destroyer of minds as well as <laughs> uh, performance is concerned but also the soul savior for the masses where personal mobility is concerned uh, the tvs apache oh good bike very yeah. good bike and finally if you were to recommend a bike to a youngster to start off and to experience the joys of riding what would you do tough one <laughs> putting you in a spot <laughs> a tough one because uh, honestly speaking uh, he has to start from ground zero mm-hmm. so 
first and foremost if he knows best to start on a scooter mm. go on to a 100 cc 125 mm-hmm. cc bike mm. and go through that phase you know yeah. and let's do the same thing with the cars alto Mm, again, the backbone of the masters of crossover. Uh, the Honda City. Oh, wonderful car! Uh, unfortunately, the character has changed mm. dramatically from mm. the very first. Uh, that really spoiled us all, you know. Yeah. The Centro. Centro was, if there is a uh, car which defied logic, then it had to be the Centro because it defied logic because of its looks, mm. but it delivered because of the way it performed. The Tata Indica. the bedrock for all indian design the tata nano i think the tata nano is the most unluckiest car in the entire world i've heard from experts all over the world mm. the design of the car in this generation in this century top notch unfortunately tata's bungled up big time in perception in positioning and also i'm sad to say a political class never supported an indian company mm. so i think the politicians really speaking dismembered the nano project uh, do you think the nano can come back as an ev yeah it can but i would say that for that you need to give it more good appealing stuff i need it to be a little flashy mm. i need it to have slightly wider wheels mm-hmm. you need to in- see the how mil- about a 600 cc bike engine in the back of a nano i don't mind that <laughs> i don't mind that at all but at the end of the day you ne- like for instance you cannot think less they thought less on certain like in the day and age where disc brakes are important mm. you still had drum brakes mm. in the front mm. you mm. cannot do that you mm. know in mm. this day and age now that is hygiene mm. you cannot do that uh, speaking about electrics the reva the original reva it was ahead of its time for country mm. uh, of our country mickey mouse design every <laughs> and it is not just reva alone mm. any electric car built in that period everywhere in the world look mickey mouse yeah, yeah. so you can you have to have cars mm. which look mainstream you know yeah. the mahindra bolero Oh, this is one hell of a success story without anyone putting a finger on why it's a success story. <laughs> it still does the numbers for this ma- manufacturer. Bread and butter, right? Absolutely, bread, butter, and jam as well. <laughs> uh, the Renault Duster. Renault Duster. Yeah, it came in at a time when these compact SUVs were there. It had a easy run because there was no competition. Then the uh, Creta and the Brezza came in. it stopped that progress across over there then renault made a uh, the captur again mm. which was could not replicate the success of the mm. duster mm. so yes it renault did that thing european sort of thing and what not but i still feel the renaults the europeans in this class of car they need to give more refinement okay the japanese and the uh, koreans yeah. have got that and the equipment levels also yeah. strong uh the car that you owned when i first went to your house for an interview uh that was i had a maruti st yeah and then i it was a great car yeah. it was a really great car i am kicking myself that i sold it off <laughs> uh but it was a great car and after that i had a toyota qualis the very first qualis which was sold in pune i loved that car to bits I remember we used to go to Bombay to mm. put overdrive to press mm. every month and the rest of the guys would go in the Honda City and uh, you would uh, take me along in the Qualis and I remember you really loved that car yeah it was a great car yeah. it it set the foundations for Toyota's success in the country uh what about Ford in India Ford has been an opportunity missed because it came in with the performance uh, background uh, pleasure of driving riding etc all those stuff but it never transferred and i think the american companies which came in both ford and general motors i felt that they displayed a certain tinge of arrogance for the mm. indian mm. boy you know mm. you cannot tell the way and they were always thumping themselves in the back saying oh what a great job it did mm. they didn't allow the market to tell them whether mm. a great job was done mm. or not mm. i think that grated as far as the indian consumer was concerned and uh, the logical thing happened Ford at least gave a semblance of good quality, but its parts were phenomenally expensive. Mm. General Motors, I don't think they gave good quality at all, and they were rampant with uh, failures in so many aspects. 
that's the reason this sh- shut shop and went uh, the influx of all the chinese manufacturers uh, we already have mg great wall is going to be coming to the auto expo we'll have quite a few of them uh, in the electric uh, bike space we have a ton of them what do you think of that I'm skeptical about everyone accepting MG right now. Okay. Because uh, bikes, I don't think, whatever we have got, once the juggernaut from the Indian manufacturers begins on the bikes, mm. the Chinese are history. Mm-hmm. Trust mm-hmm. me, the Chinese will be history. Mm. And I think as far as MG is concerned, because it has got the parent company, the SAIC, yes. and it has done very well in certain they need to bring that essence of SAIC in a certain manner mm. to be relevant with the minimal quality levels which we see. Hmm. The hmm. MG Hector is a big package hmm. for the money. Hmm. It seduces everyone. Hmm. We now need to give it time to see whether it will last that way. Hmm. And finally, what is the one bike and one car that you're looking forward to in the months or even years to come? No, let's not put it that way. Hmm. Ask me what bike or car I would like to have in my garage, whether I use it daily or not. Okay, so your dream garage? Uh, car, it has got to be the Ford GT40. Okay, the GT40. It has, yeah. I, I grew up <laughs> reading about the fabled <laughs> battles between Ford and Ferrari. And the movie is coming out very soon? That's okay, the movie is, uh, is coming out now, but yeah. I started reading yeah. about it in the yeah. late 60s. So, the Ford GT40 was the car which did it for me. Mm. And if you are talking about the bike, it has to be the Honda 504 or the Honda 754. Okay. That's what gave the impetus for the super bikes of today. Uh, do you have either of these in your garage? I want to have them. I've got models, yeah. yes, of both of them. I, I should actually ask you about that. <laughs> uh, it's a uh, uh, insane number of car models that you have. I'm sure it is the largest in India. It probably is. Uh, no, it will rank in the top 10, top 20, top 30 in the world. No, no. What is this craze for the model cars, Adil? I remember coming back from Europe with suitcases full of model cars for you. I still do it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the kid in me is not gone away. <laughs> uh, and actually speaking, you've got to remain a kid in this way. Mm. Otherwise, the creative juices will not flow. It's just that people collect stamps. I collect model cars. And I don't keep them boxed in. The thing, every most of over two and a half thousand cars are displayed. Mm. The other three and a half, four thousand cars are packed because I don't have, wife doesn't allow me more space in the house. When will you start a car museum? As soon as many of my books earn a lot of money. (laughs) 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 Adil, I wish you all the best with your books. Thank Thank you you very much for being on the Thrill of Driving podcast. Uh, You can listen to this podcast on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts. Also watch it on YouTube, on the Evo India channel. And leave us a comment. Tell us what you think of the podcast. If you have any more questions for Adil, you can fire away on social media at Adil Jal, at Sirish Chandran, at Evo India. You can leave us comments on the YouTube comments page. We will get back to you with responses from Adil and from myself. Thank you for watching. Thank you, Adil. Thanks, guys.